because the fault zone's busted up rock. It's easy to erode. It's the point where we need to connect the river. So we just see as this thing keeps sliding along, the river keeps growing right along the fault zone to stay connected from one block to the other. So these stream offsets are something to look for. Oftentimes you get what we call a sag pond. It's just a collection pond. There's no outflow. It was just a low in the topography, and as it slid along, it slid next to an area that was a high in the topography on the other block. And now all of a sudden, we've got this low, and it's just catching all the water and becoming kind of this pond but there's no real connection to any of the drainage system. So we see these sag ponds, and usually one side of them will be kind of long and flat. You can kind of pick out where the, where the fault goes. Things like fence lines, pathways, anything that kind of shows this, you know, 90 degree jog is offset, is a good clue that you're jumping from one block to the other on a straight slip fault. Here are a couple of examples. Here's the San Andreas Fault. You can just see the San Andreas cutting through the countryside. I mean, for literally hundreds of miles, you can trace this thing down the coast of California, right through Silicon Valley. That's why there's a valley there. Right through San Francisco, right out through Point Reyes National Park to the Pacific. You can trace this all the way along. You can see it on the air photos. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906, even though San Francisco really got wiped, the area that really showed the most earth movement was the area just to the south of San Francisco. And through bare fields, you could see, you could see the scar, you could see offset up to six feet in the land surface. You could just trace that fault right through there where the motion had occurred. Today, those are the suburbs of Silicon Valley. You can trace that fault still on the air photos, and you can trace it through backyards, right through the middle of houses. You can just look at it and you go, how did they ever let people build a subdivision? It was before the building codes they have today. Today, it never would have happened, but it's there now. And how would you like the San Andreas Fault running through your basement? There are people that have that. It's kind of a scary thing. Here's an apple orchard. You can pick out the fault running through the apple orchard because the tree lines have been offset. Now, there's an even more detailed way of describing these faults. They're strike slip, so you know they're moving side to side, right? But which way did they move? Did it move this way? Or did it move this way? And I can tell you that just by looking at the fault. The trick is, stand here on the fault block and look across the fault to the other side of the fault. So here I am. I'm standing here looking over here. Here's the stream to my left. <coughs> which way did this stream move? That one? had to move over to the right, didn't I? What if I'm standing over here looking at this fault block? Which way did this stream move? Moved to my right, didn't it? Because I've turned around 180 degrees. Either way, I'm looking across the fault. I get the same perspective when I turn around 180 degrees. This is what we call a right lateral strike slip or um, strike slip fault. Okay. So right lateral, the central motion is right to right. What do we see here? Come up, there's my tree line, slipped off to the right. So a couple of right lateral strike slip falls here. So that's what's going on in California. You look at Big San Andreas fault system, and it's basically right lateral, strike slip fault, horizontal fault. Here's a picture uh, that comes up through uh, the uh, Los Angeles area right in here. 
big interstate, lots of uh, subdivisions. What do you think this is? You see another one back here. Those are the sag ponds, aren't they? And here's the San Andreas Hall, right through there. Here's the interstate, right next to the San Andreas Hall. Here's where everybody lives, right next to the interstate. Is this disaster waiting to happen? Probably. Okay. What if instead of slipping to the right, I look across the fault and I see that, oh, it moved to the left. Obviously then we're going to call it a left lateral strike slip fault. And one of the best examples of that is over in Scotland. It's on the uh, Great Glen Fault. Here, here's Scotland here. And this is what it looked like 350 million years ago. And here's the fault. And you see this big fault. And right here in the middle of Scotland was this granitic intrusion, this big baffle that's sticking up. Fault cut right through that baffle. Since then, we've seen the Scottish block, this southern part, moving in this direction to the right, and on that, uh, sorry, to the left, and to the left. So what's happened is my baffle is been cut in half. This part's moved to the left in comparison to this part that's moved to the left. This is a big left lateral strike slip fall. And notice all these parts of the ocean now have been cut off, and today there are little lakes along that fault zone. And in Scotland, these lakes are called blocks. And the one that sidles right up next to this end of the batholith is Loch Ness. This is what it looks like. And of course, everybody knows Loch Ness or Nessie the Lake Monster, right? And they've had all sorts of expeditions trying to find this thing. And nothing's ever surfaced, except for this one picture. Well, about five, six years ago, this very esteemed doctor in the town up there uh, was on his deathbed. And he had lived there all his life. He says, well, before I die, I've got to tell you this. He said, you know, the, this picture here of, of Nessie, well, some of my friends and I had been at the, the pub that night and had, had a few pints and decided, wouldn't it be fun to do something cool? And it was a foggy night, so we went out and we made this paper mache dinosaur and stuck it in the lake and took these pictures in the fog and purposely made it a little out of focus so it'd be kind of hard to tell, but it would look like this monster. And we just showed it around to our friends and unfortunately, all of our friends thought it was real, and it got passed on to the newspaper, and the newspaper printed it, and it got into the, you know, and it just mushroomed on and got out of hand. And he said, it was just a clay or a paper mache dinosaur about this high. So the best piece of evidence that Nessie the, the lake monster exists has uh, kind of been refuted now. And despite everybody wanting it to be a plesiosaur that got cut off uh, and, and trapped in the lake and all these things, um, uh, there probably isn't a whole lot of real evidence to support it. However, it's developed a great tourist industry. And now, um, nobody wants it to go away because a lot of mess. About the only thing going on there is uh, the tourist industry looking for the, the lake monster. So. Uh, the only thing that's really there to look at is this really great left lateral strike slip fall. <laughs> that's kind of what, what all that amounts to. So, true or false? The San Andreas Fault in California is a left lateral strike slip fall.
It is a strike to a fault. But when you stand on one side and look across, everything's moving to the right. So essentially, that would say that the United States is moving kind of counterclockwise, and it would say that everything along the coast of California and stuff is just sliding up next to uh, Alaska eventually. So, uh, given enough time, we're not seeing California just fall off the edge into the Pacific. It's sliding along, and it's sliding to the northwest. So it's kind of twisting around, would be up there by Alaska eventually. So right lateral strikes would be the right answer. So I go out and I look at these faults and I take striking dips on them and I do all this stuff. And what we generally find is, to call it strictly a dip slip fault or a strike slip fault is very rare. Usually what we see is it's a combination of both. Now, we tend to classify them either as dip slip or strike slip based on what is the primary component of movement. But if you look at it, it's a little of both, which means they're moving at an oblique angle. They're not moving up, they're not moving sideways, they're kind of in between. So we call these faults oblique slip faults. And when it's just kind of almost half and half, you can't decide whether it's really strike or dip, you call it a blink. But the reality is almost every one of these strike slip and dip slip faults has some component of a bleakness to it. <coughs> Nothing's perfect. So that's kind of the way we look at faults. So at this point, you've now gotten everything that you need for the midterm exam. But we're not done for the day. We've still got a half hour to go. Okay. So what we've done is we've really focused on making Earth materials, making Earth, going through the solar system, making the planet, making the materials and explaining the materials that make up the Earth, minerals, rocks, and how things work as far as plate tectonics and how we deform the rocks and make structures like mountains and basins and things like that. So what I want to do now is shift gears a little bit and become a little more oriented toward, well, let's fill up one of those basins with water. Let's make the oceans, talk about them a little bit. And then I'm really going to start shifting gears because I want to talk about process instead of materials. I'm pretty much kind of making a transition here. It's been mainly materials so far. Now we want to start thinking in terms of how things work, how things get to form process oriented. How we're taking those materials that we've made and we're transforming them, we're working on them. One of the first things we're going to talk about is the oceans, one of the most dynamic systems on Earth. This is just a really cool picture. This is taken from the International Space Station, and you're basically looking at the Pacific Ocean. And look at all the different weather that's happening over the Pacific. Look at this huge, giant, amblehead thunderstorm that's going on right in this area. Look at the little thunderheads that are popping up over here. Nice weather over right in this area. And this faint blue line that you kind of see right along here. Between the surface of the planet and the dark of outer space. That thin blue line that you're seeing is our atmosphere. That's it. That's all the atmosphere we've got doesn't look like much when you put it in this perspective, does it? That's the air we breathe. That's what keeps life going on Earth. That thin little strip of blue. So it kind of makes you have a little better appreciation, I think at least, that eh, there's not a lot of that out there and we probably ought to take care of it so it doesn't go away. And we don't make it so toxic 
that we can't use it. So as Earth becomes more and more and more populated, and we create more waste and more pollution, we've really got to start thinking about how we take care of this stuff. We can't just throw it out there anymore. We've got to be recycling it. We've got to reuse it. It's the only way we can maintain the atmosphere, the oceans, and the basically livability of the planet that we've got. So I think this little picture of how thin that atmosphere really is kind of helps drive that point home. But things are a lot more fragile than you think. But when we looked at the deep ocean, uh, with our new understanding of plate tectonics that's developed over the last 50 years or so, the ocean looks a lot different than we thought it was going to be. Look at the big spreading ridges here down through the mid-Atlantic, here through the East Pacific rise, the Indian Ocean, the world's biggest mountain chain. It's huge. If we were to drain the oceans of water and those mountain chains were exposed, they would rival, they would be bigger than the Himalayas or any of the other mountain chains exposed on the continents now. And when we look at the basins, our view isn't just this bathtub idea that we used to have, but if I were to draw a cross section starting here at point A in, in North America up by Canada and come across the point B here in Africa, the cross section I'd get along this line is way different than what I would have drawn 50, 60 years ago. I see these continental shelves here right by the continents that we always knew were there, but now we understand that these are still parts of the continent. They're not part of the ocean, they're really parts of the continent. They are the fractured and faulted edges of the rift system when that basin started to open up. And they're still in, they've subsided, they've gotten covered in sediment, but they are still essentially continental granites. Completely different than what we would have thought. And out in the middle, we see this giant spreading ridge. So we see this big mountain system. We see sediments forming the abyssal plains in between, sediments washing off off of the uh, shelves here, forming these wedges of sediment at the base of the slopes, filling in across out into the ocean. So a whole different view than just a few years ago. One of the things that I think everybody kind of clicks into when they think of the ocean versus like the Great Lakes is the fact that the oceans are salty. The water is different out there. The fresh water of the Great Lakes is fresh partly because it's cycling through at a pretty fast rate. Out in the oceans, it's accumulating and it's not cycling through that, but it's so large that we only cycle through a portion of it every, every thousand years. So the salts have gotten to a point where they've accumulated. It's not getting any saltier. The input of new salty materials, new ions, is just about equal to the removal of ions. So we've got salt water out in the oceans. For the most part, <coughs> excuse me, for the most part when we look at it, there's only about 3.4% um, of the material out in the ocean that's salt. The rest is just water, H2O molecules, pure water, fresh water. But 3.4% of it is salt ions. And for the majority of that, it is chloride ions, which handily like to hook onto all sorts of things, in particular sodium, and manganese, or I'm sorry, magnesium, calcium, potassium, a few others. But chloride is just one of those handy things that just loves to make ionic 